Okay. All right. So. doing that okay um, let's see droid cam let's just make sure that it's connected here all right here we go all right there we go. We are live, everyone. Shalom. I'm Brother Doug we, with the Awakened by Yahuwah Fellowship group in Yahuwah Almighty and Yahushua Messiah. All right. So let me just see here. Why is. Okay. All right. There we go. We're back. All right. So we're going to be doing our half tour reading today. And let me get this to the cloud here. Okay. All right, so here we go. Like I said, I'm Brother Doug. Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. We're going to be doing our half tour reading. I'm going to be starting us off here. Um, so let's see here. We're going to be going with, I'm going to get my program ready here. I don't think I'm going to be using eSword, so let me exit out of that. We're going to be doing, I'll use the Word software here. And here we go. Let that open up. Okay. Just waiting for it to open up. There we go. All righty. Okay, come on. Word software. Come on, bud. Okay, here we go. All right. So here we go. As always, I'll be using a parallel of the Targum Uncolos and the Brenton Septuagint. Okay. All right. So LXXE, change this to ONK. All right. And, all right. There we go. Let's go to. Leviticus 21, we'll be starting at here. Here we go. Leviticus chapter 21. And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron. You shall tell them that they shall not defile themselves in their ethnos for the dead or their ethnicity for the dead. Okay. For a relative who is very near to them, for a father and mother, sons and daughters, for a brother, for a virgin sister that is near to one, that is not a spouse to a man, for these one shall defile himself, meaning basically bury the dead of his family. Okay, so don't get tripped up by defiling himself. Yahuwah is not saying that they can sin. Okay, he's just talking about ceremonial uncleanness and ritual uncleanness for the Levites. These are commandments strictly for the Levites. Okay. All right, so moving on here to verse 4 here. Okay, he shall not defile himself suddenly among his people, feign himself. You shall not shave your head for the dead. Okay, whole context of this chapter is doing stuff for the dead, okay? It's not saying, it's not even saying here that that it's bad to get a haircut, okay? I want to make that clear. This, this is the context here, okay? For the dead. And it's talking about for the Levites anyway. These are commandments for the Levites, okay? With a baldness on the top, and they shall not shave their beard, Neither shall they make gashes on their flesh. Again, for the Levites, about shaving their beard, okay? 
It's important to understand that these commandments, verse 1 started out saying, speak to the priest. It didn't say speak to all the children of Israel. Okay. Again, just keep that in mind. Context is key. All right. Um, neither shall they make gashes in their flesh. Now, obviously, since this is like a, a idolatry practice, obviously we can say, you know, that would apply also to all of Israel since that's referring to doing the stuff for the dead and defiling yourself and, you know, um, how in modern day society, emos will cut themselves and it's like very demonic. You know, obviously I don't think Yahuwah would want any of his people doing that. That's common sense, but moving on here. They shall be set apart to their Alhim and they shall not profane the name of their Alhim for they offer the sacrifices of Yahuwah, the gifts of their Alhim, and they shall be set apart. They shall not take a woman who is a harlot or pro and profaned or a woman put away from her husband. Now, if you have a translation that says divorce, that is a mistranslation. I'm going to let you know right now. Okay. Septuagint says put away. So does the Targum Ankalos. Put away. There's a difference between a woman being put away and you marrying her and a woman that is fully divorced. Okay, it's not unlawful to marry a woman that has been divorced. Okay, so for he is set apart to Yahuwah's Alahim, and you shall set him apart. He shall offer the gifts of Yahuwah your Alahim. He shall be set apart for I, Yahuwah, that set them apart, am set apart. And if the daughter of a priest, so this is talking about daughters of Levites or daughters of even priests in general. Okay, should be profane to go a whoring. She profanes the name of her father. She shall be burnt with fire. So obviously, daughters of Aaron were held to a very high standard, extremely higher standard um, than the rest of the Israelites, as you can see here, because even if she messes up once, commits harlotry once, she's burned with fire. That's her punishment. She dies. Okay, and the priest that is chief among his brothers the oil having been poured upon the head of the anointed one and he having been set apart to put on the garments shall not take the miter off his head. He shall not rent his garments. The miter is kind of like the turban, you know, neither shall he go into any dead body. Neither shall he defile himself for his father or his mother. Okay. He shall not go forth out of the set-apart place. He shall not profane the set-apart place of his Alahim because the set-apart anointing oil of Alahim is upon him. I am Yahuwah. He shall take for a wife a virgin of his own tribe. Again, for the priests. Okay, It's not for all Israelites that you have to marry a virgin. Okay, <clears throat> But a widow or one that is put away or profaned, or a harlot, these shall he not take, but he shall take for a wife a virgin of his own people. And he shall not profane his seed among his people. I am Yahuwah that sets him apart. And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, Say to Aaron, a man of the tribe throughout your generations, who shall have a blemish on him. And notice how this is just talking about a physical blemish. This is actually not talking about sin. This is why uh, I mention to people when you when you see the word tamim in the Masoretic text, it's not always referring to sin. It's sometimes it's talking about a physical genetical blemish. Okay. A blemish on him shall not draw near to offer a gifts of his Alahim. No man who has a blemish on him shall draw near a man blind, lame, his nose disfigured or his ears cut off. Again, a genetical blemish. Okay. A man who has a broken hand or a broken foot or a humpbacked or a blear eyed or that has lost his eyelashes or a man who has a malignant ulcer or tether or one that has a lost testicle 
whoever of the seed of Aaron, the priest has a blemish on him, shall not draw near to offer sacrifices to your Alahim because he has a blemish on him. He shall not draw near to offer the gifts of Alahim. The gifts of Alahim most set apart, and he shall eat of the set apart things. Okay. Only he shall not approach the veil and shall not draw near to the altar because he has a blemish and he shall not profane the set apart place of his Elohim for I am Yahuwah that sets them apart. And Masha spoke to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Yashur all. Okay. All right. And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his two sons, and let them take heed concerning the set-apart things of the children of Yashrael, so they shall not profane my set-apart name and any of the things which they set apart to me. I am Yahuwah. So now Yahuwah is about to talk about sacrifices. We're in uh, chapter 22 now of Leviticus. Okay, Say to them, every man throughout your generations, whoever of all your seed shall approach to the set apart things. Whosoever the children of Yasharal shall set apart to Yahuwah while his uncleanness is upon him, that soul shall be cut off from me. I am Yahuwah. Okay. And the man of the seed of Aaron, the priest, if he should have leprosy of issue of the rain, shall not eat of the set apart things until he be cleansed. He that touches any uncleanness of a dead body or the man whose seed of copulation shall have gone out from him. Or whosoever shall touch any unclean reptile, which will defile him or a man whereby he shall defile him according to all his uncleanness. And again, I can see how this would infer touching anything unclean of itself as a sin, but we got to use context, pre-established context from Leviticus chapter 11. It says it's a sin to touch a dead body of an unclean animal. That's most likely what we, what you, who is referring to here. Okay. It's not, it's not a sin to, to touch a living unclean animal. Okay. So again, we got to use context, pre-established Torah commandments from 10 chapters earlier, okay? So Yahuwah is not going to contradict himself. Okay? Just because he doesn't mention the carcass, you can pretty much infer from Leviticus 11 that obviously that's what he's referring to. Okay? So because Doug, that's the that only mean, command he gives. Doug, does that mean that if you're inside of a room where there's a dead body that you're unclean? Or is it just if you yeah, touch? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's actually a command that says that you're unclean for seven days and you have to ceremoniously, you know, bathe in water. And then after the end of seven days, you're on, you're clean again um, at evening. So that that that's why if you go to a funeral, just just know that you're going to be ceremonially unclean. Not that it's sin, but you're going to be ceremoniously unclean for seven days. Um, and that's, that's for all of Israel, as far as if you're in the vicinity of a dead body, uh, but so if you're in a room where there's a dead body with an open casket, that's the same thing as being ceremoniously unclean for seven days. Well, it's not the same thing, sis. It, that's part of the rule. Part of the rule is you have, by doing that, you have become ceremoniously unclean. That is the cause of it. That's one of the commands in Torah is that certain things cause you to be ritually or ceremoniously unclean for a allotted period of time. A woman on her period, for another example, is ceremoniously unclean for a period of time. And there's many different things that happen that we can't prevent. It's not that it's sin, right. but we can't prevent and we're just by default. We're ceremoniously unclean and we can't bring sacrifices to Yahuwah for a certain period of time. That's what this chapter is talking about. It's saying if you want to offer a gift, meaning first fruits, mm -hmm. sacrifices, firstlings of your flock, wait until you're ceremoniously clean again. That's all it's saying. So basically, mm -hmm. if you do it while you're unclean, then it becomes sin. Mm -hmm. And that's what Yahuwah is 
telling the Levites here and to tell the people that you don't, you don't and it's even worse if a Levite does it. So that's what he's getting into here. Doug, will that apply to, let's say, before Passover or Shavuot or Sukkot? Will that apply to that? Let's say oh, someone it, dies within that within that period and you go to the funeral yeah, and yeah, there's an open yeah. casket. So does that does that ceremoniously make you unclean? And that means that then you can't participate in that particular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually, yes, yeah, since that's the purpose of the second Passover, actually, in context. Because what happened was there were certain men that couldn't offer the sacrifice of Passover. Like there were certain sacrificial offerings for Passover that that um, these men couldn't offer. And it's kind of hinted that they're Levites too. I mean, it doesn't literally say they're Levites, but it's kind of hinted anyway. Uh, uh, and it says that, you know, Yahuwah tells Masha to tell these men, listen, you're ceremoniously unclean. You can't keep it on the 14th of this month. You're not going to be able to do it. But you can do it on the 14th of the second month of the year. So he tells them to wait a month. So they're ceremoniously clean. So that's what most people don't understand. The purpose of the second Passover is not because, you know, you don't have enough people with you or you can't do it. You can't, you can't do it perfectly. The purpose of waiting to the second month is that you are ritually unclean and it specifically says by if they're ritually unclean by touching a dead body so it actually lets you know in the book of numbers that's the reason for the second passover and or you're too far away from the temple but we can't use that excuse we're we're all spread out number one there's no temple we're not in jerusalem so that 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 excuse can't really be used for for waiting to the second month uh, the, Yahuwah doesn't have a place where his name is at at this time and period in the Melchizedek priesthood. There's no actual temple of Yahuwah at this point. So we can't, we can't say we're far off on a journey if we're, if we're just not in Jerusalem and we're in America. We can't, we can't like spiritualize that. Yahuwah gave that command when there was a place to bring offerings to, when there was a place that his name literally was put upon. You know, he literally says, I chose this place to put my name, um, you know, so again, if we take that literally, there's no way we can use that as an excuse. Um, all of us are in captivity um, as far as being a far away on a journey. Uh, you know, I don't think that's a viable. Uh, we can use that. I don't think that's applicable today to use that as a, a legitimate excuse to wait until the second month. Um, the only the only way you should be waiting until the second month from what I see in scripture in the Torah is the dead body thing. You're ritually unclean and you can't you can't be, you know, keeping the Passover if you're ritually unclean. Yahuwah doesn't want, you know, um, because we're still basically even in the Passover, even though we're ceremonial is ceremonializing it and we're not able to fully keep it still um you know these these feast days you're coming into his presence you need to be ceremoniously clean in his presence um you know and and, and that's the difference so i i would say definitely if you're if you went to a funeral right before a beep happens you you should wait until the second month for passover um you know, so that, um, to me, that's a viable excuse. And I forget what chapter is it, it is in numbers, but it literally says he who has become clean by touching a dead body. So it literally tells you what, what the uncleanness is that they're waiting until the second month. But anyway, um, good question though, sis. Great question. Okay, so we're going to move on here. Verse 6. Whatsoever soul that touches him shall be unclean until the evening. He shall not eat of the set-apart things only as he bathed his body in water. Again, it's talking about touching the carcass of an unclean animal. That's why you would be unclean until evening. Um, and you can find that concept in Leviticus chapter 11 um, towards the end of it. I think it's verses 30 to like 44. Um, okay. And the sun go down. Okay. This is when a day starts. Okay. Sunset. Then he shall be clean. Notice how every time at sunset, you're clean. Now you're ceremoniously clean. Now it's a new day starts. Okay. 
And then shall he eat of all the set apart things, for they are his bread. Okay. Okay, so that's talking about the priest. So he has to wait. He cannot eat of offerings. He cannot eat of the first fruits, the sheaf offering, until he is clean that following evening, uh, that sunset of that day. Okay. He shall not eat that which dies of itself, which pretty much we see in other places. All Israelites are commanded not to eat anything that dies of itself, but you can give it to a Gentile. Okay. Um, or is taken of beasts so that he should be polluted by them. I am Yahuwah. And they shall keep my ordinances that they do not bear lawlessness because of them and die because of them. If they shall profane them, I am Yahuwah Alihim that sets them apart. All right, and no stranger shall eat of this set apart things. One that sojourns with a priest or a hired servant shall not eat the set apart things. If a, but if a priest should have a soul purchased for money, he shall eat of his bread. And they that are born in his house, they also shall eat of his bread. I see like a little parallel here in verse eleven to Yahusha, because what did he do on the stake? He purchased us. We were bought with a price, right? So I find that interesting. Uh, 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 similarity between uh, the Levites and Yehusha. So, and if the daughter of a priest should marry a stranger, she shall not eat of the offerings of the set-apart place. Yeah, because she now she's part of that household of, of, of a stranger, okay? She's no longer a daughter of a priest. And if the daughter of a priest should be a widow or put away and have no seed, she shall return to her father's house. And as in her youth, she shall eat of her father's bread, but no stranger shall eat of it. So again, a widow or being put away. So obviously a widow means that her husband died. So she's no longer married. The law of her husband, as Paul talks about in Romans 7. Mm -hmm. Okay. She is released from the law of her husband if her husband dies. Okay, so now she would be able to become part of her father's house again. Okay. All right, so. And the man who shall ignorantly eat set apart things shall add the fifth part to it, give and give the set apart thing to the priests, and they shall not profane the set apart things of the children of Yashur, all which they offer to Yahuwah. So they should bring upon themselves the lawlessness of trespass in their eating their set apart things. For I, Yahuwah, that sets them apart. And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, to all the congregation of Yasharal. You shall say to them, Any man of the children of Yasharal or of the strangers that abide among them in Yasharal, who shall offer his gifts to all their confession and according to all their choice, whatsoever they may bring to Yahuwah's sacrifice. Um, for the whole burnt offerings, your free will offerings shall be males without blemish of the herds, or of the sheep, or of the goats. They shall not bring to Yahuwah anything that has a blemish in it. Again, you know, Tamim, okay. For it shall not be acceptable for you. And whatsoever man shall offer a peace offering to Yahuwah, discharging a vow, or in the way of a free will offering, or in offering your feasts, of the herds or of the sheep, it shall be without blemish for acceptance. There shall be no blemish in it. One that is blind. So it's actually defining what type of blemish he's talking about here. It's not talking about sin. Again, tamim can sometimes mean without blemish physically, not spiritually. So that's why he's following up talking about physical defects, not spiritual defects. Okay. One that is blind broken or has its tongue cut off or is troubled with warts or has malignant ulcer tetters, they shall not offer these to Yahuwah, neither shall you offer any of them for a burnt offering on the altar of Yahuwah and a calf or a sheep with the ears cut off or that has lost its tail, you shall slay them for yourself, but they shall not be accepted for your vow. That which has broken testicles or crushed or gelt or mutilated, you shall not offer them to you who and neither shall you sacrifice them upon your land. Neither shall you offer the gifts of your Elohim of all these things by the hand of a stranger. 
because there is corruption in them, a blemish in them. These shall not be accepted for you. And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, As for a calf or a sheep or a goat, whenever it is born, then shall be seven days under its mother. And uh, on the eighth day, after they shall be accepted for sacrifices, a burnt offering to Yahuwah. And a bullock and an ewe, it and its young, you shall not kill in one day. Okay. And you should offer a sacrifice, a vow of rejoicing to Yahuwah. You shall offer it so as to be accepted for you. In that same day, it shall be eaten. You shall not leave of the flesh till the morning I or till the next day. I am Yahuwah. You shall keep my commandments and do them. You shall not profane the name of the set apart one. I will be set apart. In the midst of the show of Yasharal, I am Yahuwah that sets you apart, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your Alihim. Or probably maybe it's Alua, actually. Okay. I am Yahuwah. So it looks like it might be actually singular there. Okay. Either way, we're going to go to chapter 23 of Leviticus now. One of my favorite chapters known as the... Uh, Feast hotspot here. Okay. All right. Here we go. Leviticus 23. And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, Speak to the children of Yashrael. You shall say to them, The feasts of Yahuwah, which you call set apart assemblies, these are my festivals, my feasts. Okay. Six days you shall do works, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath or rest. I like how there's a little bit of Greek in the Uncalos. That's interesting. Because a lot of the times the Sabbath will be called rest in the in the Septuagint in the Greek New Testament. So that's kind of interesting that on Kalos there has a little bit of Greek in there. Is a rest. So oh no, okay. It's also there too. Okay. Anyway. A set apart convocation to Yahuwah, you shall not do any work. It is a Sabbath to Yahuwah in all your dwellings. So notice. Notice the the emphasis on all your dwelling places. Mm -hmm. So we can't say because there's no temple, we can't keep the Sabbath. Right here is showing that you can keep the Sabbath anywhere you are. And this is like a phrase I always pay attention to um, when I'm reading scripture. Okay, That's an important phrase there at the end, in all yeah, your dwellings. Man. You know, <laughs> you can't make an excuse there. It's all your dwellings, everywhere you live. These are the feasts to Yahuwah set apart gatherings, which you shall call in their seasons. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, between the evening times, between the sunsets, you could say. And it actually literally says that in Lonkalos, between the suns. I like that. Okay. Is Yahuwah's Passover. And so even the feast days, you have to count from sunset to sunset as a regular day goes. You can't, you can't do morning to sunset. Okay, and on the 15th day of this month is a feast of unleavened bread to you who has seven days shall you eat unleavened bread on the first day <laughs> shall be a set apart gathering. <clears throat> you shall do no servile work you shall offer whole burnt offerings to you who has seven days and the seventh day shall be a set apart gathering to you, you shall do no servile work. Okay. And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, Speak to the children of Yasharal. You shall say to them, When you shall enter into the land which I give you and reap the harvest of it, then you shall bring a sheep, the first fruits of your harvest, to the priest. Okay. And he shall lift it up, lift up the sheep before you who to be accepted for you. On the morrow of the first day, the priest shall lift it up. Okay. So again, these commandments have a lot to do with the Levitical priesthood, as you can see. Okay. You shall offer on the day on which you bring the sheaf a lamb without blemish of a year old for a whole burnt offering to Yahuwah and its grain offering. Sometimes you'll see in the old ones, old Bibles, it will say meat offerings, not referring to an animal. It's referring to grain offerings. Okay. Because right here it says flour, fine flour mingled with oil as the meat offering. I mean, that, that should be your first like light bulb moment if you have a translation that says meat offering, but it's talking about bread, okay? Um, it, it is a sacrifice to Yahuwah, a smell sweet savor to Yahuwah. 
and his drink offering, the fourth part of the hen of wine. And you shall not eat bread or parched gr or new parched grain, not green ears uh, on Kalos. Why? Yeah, they were already changing it, already changing it in, in the Targums to green ears. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's, it's new grain, okay, not green ears, all right? Until this same day, until you offer the sacrifice to your Alihim, a perpetual statue throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Because it wouldn't make sense to be green ears, number one. Green ears means something starts to grow, okay? Yeah. Uh, it's talking about plucking off ripened grain. So which makes more sense, new grain or green ears? I mean, that's just common sense there. Anyway. And you shall number to yourselves from the day after the Sabbath on the day on which you shall offer the sheaf of the heath offering seven full weeks, okay, 50 days, all right? Because the reason we know this is because he iterates it in the next verse. Until the morrow after the last week, meaning the day after the first um, festival day of the week of Passover, which that's how the Targum of Unkelos even says it. Um, oh, actually, it's the Targum of Jonathan. Let me correct myself. Tar Targum of Jonathan's a little bit more literal on this particular verse. It says the morrow after the festival day, the day after the festival, festival day, start your count. Until the morrow after the last week, you shall number 50 days and shall bring a new grain offering to Yahuwah. Okay. And you shall bring from your dwelling loaves as a heave offering two loaves. They shall be of two tenth portions of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven of the first fruits to Yahuwah. And you shall bring with the loaves seven unblemished lambs of a year old and a calf of the herd, two rams without blemish, and they shall be a burnt offer, whole burnt offering to Yahuwah and their grain offerings and their drink offerings, a sacrifice, a, swell, a smell of sweet savor to Yahuwah. Okay, and they shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, two lambs for a year old for a peace offering with the loaves of the first fruits. And the priest shall place them with the loaves of the first fruits and offering before Yahuwah with two lambs. They shall be set apart to Yahuwah. They shall belong to the priest that brings them. Okay, and they shall call this day a set apart gathering. And shall be set apart too. You shall do no servile work on it. It is a perpetual ordinance throughout your generations and all your habitations. Okay. You shall reap the harvest of your, when you shall reap the harvest of the land, you shall not fully reap the remainder of the harvest or your field. Notice how it says your land, your field. Okay. When you reap and you shall not gather that which falls from your reaping, you shall leave it for the poor and the stranger. I am Yahuwah, your Alihim. So for us to fully keep that commandment, number one, we would have to be in the land Yahuwah is going to give us. We would have to have our own field, okay, that is ours, that doesn't belong to uh, a country that we're in captive to right now so again let's keep the context of this stuff about about uh the reaping of the harvest this this was given in the context of the land you who is about to bring them into was the land of canaan that was the land he gave to them to be theirs okay let's just keep everything in context with that so because to be honest we're the stranger we're in captivity yeah. we're the stranger so you can't have it both ways. If we're the stranger, then we're not the one that owns the land that we're on, okay? So let's keep everything in context Context here, okay? And like I said before, it's not a bad thing to give to the poor. I'm just saying to be able to fully keep verse 22 there, you have to be in the land that Yahuwah is going to give us in the millennial. Um, it, it would be impossibly, uh, impossible for us to fully keep that in its context with being in a Melchizedek priesthood, number one, number two, being in uh, a land, being captives and strangers in, a, in another land that's not our own, okay? Verse 23, <clears throat> and Yahuwah spoke to Masha saying, speak to the children of Yashar all saying in the seventh month on the first day of the month, 
you shall have a rest, a memorial of trumpets. It shall be to you a set apart gathering. You shall do no survival work, and you shall offer a whole burnt offering to Yahuwah. And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, also on the 10th day of this seventh month is a day of atonement. It shall be a set apart gathering to you. You shall humble your souls. That's the commandment of atonement here. And offer a whole burnt offering to Yahuwah. Okay, so it says here, and even the Uncalos here afflict your beings or your souls. And notice how in parentheses after afflict, it says humble. Okay, so the translator of the Uncalos is agreeing with the Septuagint there. The command, the actual command that you have to do on an atonement is to literally humble yourself. That's what it's talking about. Okay. All right. Verse 28. You shall do no work on this self same day, for this is the day of atonement for you to make atonement for you before Yahuwah your Elohim. Every soul that shall not be humbled in that day shall be cut off from among his people. It does not say literally those that do not fast. So let's make sure we're not adding to scripture here. Okay. Uh, so let's make sure we're we're letting scripture, you know, interpret itself. Okay. And every soul which shall do work on that day, that soul shall be destroyed from among its people. You shall do no manner of work. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your habitations. It shall be a set apart Sabbath to you and you shall humble your souls from the ninth day of the month from evening to evening or sunset to sunset, you shall keep your Sabbaths. Notice how that's plural. Okay, so if we got any brothers and sisters out there that, <clears throat> that have received this false doctrine of a Sabbath is morning to morning or morning to evening, Leviticus 23.32, the Septuagint is telling you verbatim, it's sunset to sunset, evening to evening, not just the Day of Atonement, as Sabbaths in plural, okay? Sabbath in plural there, okay? And Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, speak to the children of Yasharal, saying, on the 15th day of this seventh month, there shall be a feast of tabernacles seven days to Yahuwah, and on the first day shall be a set apart gathering. You shall do no servile work. <clears throat> seven days you shall offer whole burnt offerings to Yahuwah, and the eighth day shall be a set apart gathering to you. You shall offer whole burnt offerings to Yahuwah. It is a time of release. You shall do no servile work. These are the feasts to Yahuwah, which you shall call set apart gatherings to offer burnt offerings to Yahuwah. <clears throat> whole whole burnt offerings and their grain offerings and their drink offerings that for each day on its day. Besides the Sabbaths of Yahuwah and besides your gifts, besides all your vows and besides your freewill offerings, which you shall give to Yahuwah. And on the 15th day of this seventh month, you shall have a complete you shall have completely gathered in the fruits of the earth. You shall keep a feast to Yahuwah seven days. On the first day, there shall be a rest, and the eighth day, a rest. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Ugh. Got to clear my throat here. And on the first day, you shall keep, you shall take um, tob leaf fruit of the trees, branches of palm trees, Thick bows of trees and willows and branches of oceans from the brook to rejoice before Yahuwah Yarlahim seven days in the year. A perpetual statue for your generations in the seventh month. You shall keep it seven days. You shall dwell in tabernacles or booths, temporary dwellings. Okay. Every native in Yashrael shall dwell in tents. Okay. That your Posterity may see that I made the children of Yashrael to dwell in tents when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. And Masha recounted the feasts of Yahuwah to the children of Yashrael. Okay, so now we are at Leviticus 24. And I believe this is going to be 
commandments for the burning of the lamps, the uh, the menorah, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, the altar of incense and all that. So here we go here. Hold on a second. I just want to get a drink of water real quick. Mm -hmm. My throat is like really dry. <clears throat> All right. So we're about to start Leviticus 24. <clears throat> all right here we go leviticus 24 and yahuwah spoke to masha saying charge the children of yashar all let them take for you pure olive oil beaten for the light to burn a lamp continually outside the veil in the tabernacle witness aaron and his sons shall burn from evening until morning before you who are continually a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall burn lamps on the pure lampstand before you who are till the morrow. And you shall take fine flour and make it of 12 loaves. Each loaf shall be of two tenth parts. You shall put them in two rows, each row six loaves on the pure table before you who are. So this, this is talking about the table of showbread. Okay. And you shall put on each row pure frankincense and salt. It shall be for loaves for a memorial set before Yahuwah. Okay. On the Sabbath day, they shall be set forth before Yahuwah continually before the children of Yashar all for an everlasting covenant. So unfortunately, the priests, even on the Sabbath, had, had to do somewhat work, unfortunately, because of the Levitical priesthood. So... That's where, um, and usually this is where Christianity, they, they try to attack us and say, well, look at the Levites. They worked on the Sabbath. But the thing is, the Levites were the priests, okay? They had to give offerings. That's, that's, that's what you call a, a, a circumstantial thing where they had to give offerings on the Sabbath, okay? That's, and it's not referring to occupational work. I mean, that's that's service to Yahuwah, okay? That I, I think that would be under Yahusha's definition of doing tobe on, on, on the uh, Sabbath, okay? And they shall be for Aaron and his sons. They shall eat them in the set-apart place, for this is their most set-apart portion of the offerings made to Yahuwah a perpetual statute. And there went forth a son of an Israelite woman and... He was a son of an Egyptian man among the sons of Yashar, and they fought in the camp. And the son of the Israelite woman and the man who was and the man who was an Israelite. The son of the Israelite woman, this is where I'm sorry, the English translation here, the Septuagint, Breton screws this up here. It's actually supposed to say he profaned the name of Yahuwah. Okay, so. This is how it's supposed to read is the son of the Israelite woman profaned the name and cursed and they brought him to Masha. So obviously you can get the context here with the word curse. Okay, it's talking about, you know, profaning you who his name. Okay. They brought him to Masha and his mother's name was Salomith, daughter of Dabri of the tribe of Dan. Okay. And they put him inward to judge him by the command of Yahuwah. I like how that says here, by the decree of the word of Yahuwah. I like that. Put that as a little note here for the Targum Unkelos. Uh, identifying Yahuwah as the word of Yahuwah. Just wanted to make a little physical note of that. Moving on. Verse 13, and Yahuwah spoke to Masha, saying, <clears throat> Bring forth him that is cursed outside the camp, and all who heard shall lay their hands upon his head, and all the congregation shall stone him. Okay, 
and speak to the sons of Yasharal, and you shall say to them, whosoever shall curse Elohim shall bear his sin. So notice the whole context is this boy cursed Yahuwah, cursed his name, his reputation. Okay. And he that profanes the name of Yahuwah, let him die the death. Let all the congregation of Yasharal stone him with stones. Whether he be a stranger or a native, let him die for profaning the name of Yahuwah. Okay. Whosoever shall smite a man and he die, let him die the death. <clears throat> and whosoever shall smite a beast and it shall die, let him render life for life. Whosoever shall inflict a blemish on his neighbor. Notice how the term blemish is being referred to as um, inflicting an injury on, on your brother. Okay, so physical blemish, not spiritual blemish. Okay, as he has done to him, so shall it be done to himself in return. Bruise for bruise, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As one may afflict a blemish on a man, so shall it be rendered to him. Whosoever shall smite a man, he shall die. Let him die the death. There shall be one right ruling for the stranger and the native, for I am Yahuwah, your Alihim. Okay. And Masha spoke to the children of Yasharal, and they brought him that had cursed out of the camp and stoned him with stones. And the children of Yasharal did as Yahuwah commanded Masha. So now that is the end of Leviticus 21 to 24. Pretty much self-explanatory, all these commands here. Can I say one thing? Yeah. <clears throat> no, obviously, no disrespect to our Savior, okay? I think I have this figured out. Now, it clearly says here, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But in in when our Savior became flesh and dwelt among us, he brought up this whole point. You heard it was said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, you know, to give your cloak, you da, 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 da. the reason he can do that, correct me if I'm wrong, is because he's the law giver. Yeah. And he can adjust well, the law. He, not, not a, no, mom, again, what is the context of Matthew 5? Is it everyday life or persecution? Again, he's talking about persecution. Okay, okay. So it's, I'm glad you brought that up because that's important to clear that up. Yahushua wasn't saying don't do that anymore. He wasn't what, going what, against the what, law. What right. he was saying was you have the option to show mercy in situations. That's what he's saying. Okay. Think about it. The woman is about to be stoned. Was he doing away with stoning no. or was he given an option for mercy? Right. So we got to understand this concept because right. this is why some of our brothers and sisters what, that what, what, are know that they are no longer believing and they've fallen away and become old and testament like only a, that's and that's like that's, a, that's a ammunition for them that, that, to that, say that, look he's yeah. he's you know yeah well that's why jewish people in general in judaism don't accept yahushua because this idea uh of this of this other messiah in christianity jesus christ is a completely different personality than what the promised son of man would be. Okay, the son of man would uphold the law. It says in Isaiah 11 that 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 the wisdom the wisdom of Elohim, the spirit of wisdom would be in him. So yeah. it would be the father himself in him having all the knowledge of the Torah. So obviously he's not going to do away with the Torah. No. So this is why Jewish people when when Christians try to witness to them and say, oh, well, Yahushua did away with stoning. He did away with eye for an eye, two for two. No, he didn't. What he's doing is in certain situations, and specifically, we've misunderstood the context of Matthew chapter 5. The Beatitudes are about persecution. Mm -hmm. When it talks about your, yes. when you're smoting on the cheek, give them the other cheek. Right. Turn the other cheek. Right. That's not an everyday life. That you turn the other right. cheek and you don't right. fight back. That's true. That's okay. True. Let's uh -huh. let's let's keep the context here. Okay. Let's let's use some common sense here. Is he talking about everyday life, like twenty four seven? You right. you just let someone abuse you in your family? No. He's talk. He's talking about in certain situations, like.
for example, persecution comes to mind because when he went to the stake, Yahusha said not one word. He was dumb as a lamb, as, as prophecy says. He was dumb as a lamb before the shearers. He said not one word as they were constantly reproaching him with their words, constantly making fun of him, smiting him on the face. So think about it. The one time he actually exercises what he says in Matthew 5 that's mm -hmm. actually recorded yeah, yeah, is yeah. in persecution. Right, correct. We have to unlearn this Christian understanding that we're just supposed to be wimps and supposed to allow people to do whatever to us with this warped understanding of Matthew 5. Okay, we, got, we got to use context here. When is the one time he actually exercised, exercised what he preached? is in Matthew 5. There's only one time he does that, and that's when he's going to the stake, when he's about to die for us. That's the only time he practices that. So, in the Hebraic mindset, they would have understood what he's talking about. He's just talking about a certain context. Right. Okay. But, of course, the Pharisees, just like Christians today, misunderstood his words, and they're like, this is going against Torah. We don't do eye for an eye, two for a tooth anymore. So that's why the Pharisees made false accusations against them, which, by the way, the Christians are making the Pharisees look like they're not liars by having that same interpretation as the Pharisees. Because that's what the Pharisees were accusing him and Stephen of all the time. You can read in the book of Acts. They're talking about Stephen believes in the guy that did away with the Torah. So guess what? If you have that understanding of the scriptures, you're actually on the Pharisee <laughs> side and not on Yahushua's side. Yahushua mm -hmm. was constantly defending himself saying, no, I'm not doing away with the law. By the way, I am the word. That's right. Okay. So it's important to understand that, that that rant was important to go into because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Matthew five has been, in my opinion, misunderstood by the majority of mainstream Christianity. I think you're right. Um, and not you not looking at historical context, not looking at the obvious context of when he practices what he preached in Matthew five. That's the only isolated time he ever did it. So yeah, there's plenty of times he cut them right down. Because think know. about it, he whipped the Pharisees in the same yeah. breath. Yeah. Then he's going and whipping the Pharisees for doing what they did in the temple. He even okay? was, you know, Kurt so, with Mary when she showed up with. With, you know, with the brothers and sisters to see him, you know, he was cut that right down. And he rebuked the Pharisees all the time. Mm -hmm. He stood up to the Pharisees all the time. So that, so we got to keep everything in context here. Okay. Yeah, you're right. That is the only time that he exercised that. That's true. I mean, if someone can find a, another instance where he's not being persecuted and he's not being afflicted, uh, brought, brought to, you know, the stake when he's about to die, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'll change my view on it, but that's my view on it right now is that it yeah, was yeah. a certain context no, is what Matthew that. five is talking about. Um, okay. Well, I'm glad anyway. I brought it up. Yeah. That was good that you brought it up mom. That was very good. Um, Cause as I said, obviously he did not transgress. Obviously he was not taking anything. I mean, he's, we know that nothing was created without him. So he was at least partially um, responsible for creating the law. Why would he go against his own law? You know, I yeah. mean, you know. Exactly. So it's one of those things you just have to delve into. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to go to the, uh, I think I'm going to change my program here. I, I like using the uh, e-sword when I'm going into the prophets because I, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of Adonais in this chapter of Ezekiel here. So we're going to be we're going to be reading Ezekiel 44 next, guys. We're going to be starting a new uh, recording. So stay tuned, everyone. We'll be there very shortly. We'll be back on the recording for our prophets portion, Ezekiel 44. Stay tuned. Shalom. <laughs> 